Okay, hi everyone. Thanks for joining, uh, and it's our greatest pleasure to welcome you in our uh, seminar, which is the, um, uh, focusing on the multicultural narratives uh, through different identities in Azerbaijan, um, which we will look at them from the approach of an, uh, anthropological and ethnographical and uh, we are aiming to showcase and, and create a healthy discussion with the con uh, contribution of our moderator Mirkam Ram Hussain Lee and uh, around the fascinating uh, researchers Yulia Aliyeva, Dr. Sevinj Nasirova, Sara Ahmedova and Farida Khalilova and we are um, our panelists will be discussing domestic life and cultural aspects of three main uh, ethnic minorities living in different parts of Azerbaijan, uh, uh, namely Germans, Jewish, and Polish. And um, this will be achieved by looking at different materials, objects kept at the National Museum of uh, uh, History of Azerbaijan. I will not go will go will not go more into detail. We have around two hours to discuss all this. Um, but before that, I will pass to Gwen to introduce house rules and um, introduce about our network. Gwen, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining. Um, so just some basic house rules, please mute yourself if you're not speaking. Um, and so switch your microphone off. Um, if you want to ask a question, either put it in the uh, chat box or use the hand um, raise hand icon. Um, and then when it's appropriate, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, also, please note that the event will be recorded and you can find the recording um, later on on our YouTube channel. Um, I also want to take a few seconds to introduce our network for those of you who are joining us for the first time. Um, so we are a group of master and PhD students all working on topics related to the Caucasus. Um, the aim of our network is to bring together uh, regional archaeological, anthropolo anthropological and historical debates um, and discuss current research carried out in the Caucasus. Uh, we're open to the fields of history, art history, anthropology, archaeology, and medieval studies, literature, and historical linguistics are related to the Caucasus and adjacent areas. Um, the network is an inclusive and encouraging environment, and we put strong emphasis on uniting and transcending national boundaries and enhancing dialogue. Uh, importantly, we also provide a space for young scholars um, to present their work and thereby facilitate knowledge, knowledge exchange between scholars and early career researchers. Um, I will now take um, a minute to introduce today's event program. Um, so first we have the uh, pleasure um, to listen to Yulia Alieva uh, talking about diversity in politics of multiculturalism in Azerbaijan, some reflections on policy and concepts. Um, next we will listen to Sevinj Nasirova um, discussing samples of material culture belonging to Azerbaijani Jews in the collection of the National Museum of History of Azerbaijan. Um, then we have the pleasure to listen to Sara Ahmadova uh, from Württemberg to Gögel, historical ethnographic uh, research. Um, and lastly, uh, we have the pleasure to listen to Farida uh, Kalikova uh, talking about the role of Talish women in the development of ancient kind of craftsmanship wicker in Azerbaijan. Um, so each talk will be followed by a five minute Q&A and in the end, um, there will be an overall discussion. Um, I will now pass on to you again, Nani. I will introduce our moderator, Mir Kamran Hussain Lee. First of all, Mir Kamran, thank you so much for accepting our offer to, to be a uh, moderator for this event. And so Mir Kamran Hussain Lee uh, currently is a lecturer of political theory and modern world history at Ada University, uh, Azerbaijan and specialize in nationalism uh, studies, comparative history, and multiculturalism citizenship theory. And Mir Kamran uh, received his first MA in political science and international relations from University of Bologna and Italy and Corvinus University of uh, Budapest. Afterwards, he uh, per, uh, pursued his second MA in nationalism studies at Central European University. Uh, Budapest. Uh, and 
before uh, moving the uh, kicking off the event, I just wanted to add one more thing. Uh, so the event is happening with a collaboration uh, with the Union of Young Scholars based in National Museum of History of Azerbaijan. So I would like to give a quick word to Aslan, who is a dedicated friend of the Caucasus Network. Okay, thank you for giving me a floor. Uh, firstly, I would like to express my uh, gratitude to the Caucasus Through Time Network for organizing this event and especially to Nermin and Gwen, whom I was in contact during uh, contact with during this arranging this uh, event. Also, uh, I am very gr grateful to the uh, committee members of the network, uh, which I don't know personally, but I know uh, they worked hard on this event. Furthermore, um, I would like to express my uh, gratitude to the, our speakers and moderators uh, for agreeing to uh, moderate and to give a uh, speech about their research, our speakers. And also, I would like uh, to speak about our museum, uh, National Museum of History of Azerbaijan. It is the first museum in Azerbaijan. It has more than 100 years old. And uh, here we have uh, archaeology, ethnography, numismatics, uh, and other uh, collections. Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, say that uh, any uh, researchers who want uh, to come, who wants to come to Azerbaijan and do any research, they can contact us. We will be uh, more than happy to help them and to collaborate with them. So uh, any archaeologists, numismatists, ethnographer, uh, or historians actually uh, can come here, visit us, and uh, we can do research together. So uh, I think it's enough and uh, we can continue. Thank you again. 10 minutes of presentation to each presenter and five minutes of Q&A at the end of each presentation. And finally, when all the presenters finish presenting their their uh, slides, um, conclude their presentations, we'll open the floor to the general discussion by involving both the audience and the presenters. Uh, but when it comes to multiculturalism, just short introduction about this theory from uh, you know, different perspectives. Multiculturalism is a broad ranging debate regarding identity politics, which is discussed within the framework of different academic disciplines, such as uh, be it political philosophy, public policy, sociology, anthropology, ethnography, and etc. And um, you know, even though we are going to particularly cover um, anthropological, maybe sociological, and eth ethnographic aspects of multiculturalism in general, and particularly the case of Azerbaijan, uh, but we will also try to touch upon during the general discussion certain maybe philosophical and state policy perspectives of theory of this theory because this theory. Uh, cannot be discussed without also, you know, um, looking at the, the policy perspectives, to what extent the policies are reflected and how it, it um, uh, affects people's daily, daily lives. Um, and most importantly, our, our speakers will present exemplary cases from Azerbaijan's various minority cultures and how these minority cultures coexist together. Um, when it comes to multiculturalism in general, uh, you guys probably already know that you know this debate of multiculturalism has started in um, Western liberal democracies in 1980s due to rising diversity as a result of um, migrant movements and rising claims of indigenous group rights. And over the last quarter of a century, this debate turned into a policy called multiculturalism. So there are several categorizations of multiculturalism amongst political scientists and sociologists and anthropologists. And uh, one categorization is the multiculturalism that particularly focuses on immigrant group rights and immigration and this kind of you know, incoming migrant uh, accommodation. Uh, these countries include like Netherlands, Britain, Sweden, Norway, or Belgium. So these are the countries from this category. The second category of multiculturalism is uh, the, the, the countries which concern mainly indigenous and local community rights, such as Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India. And it seems like the case of Azerbaijan seems to be fitting to the second category because the existing diversity of coexistence of 
different ethnic and national minorities in Azerbaijan is mainly indigenous and you know, the, the Azerbaijan case is more relevant to the indigenous rights or indigenous and national minority groups, their coexistence, their anthropological, ethnographic, and sociological aspects. So um, that's why uh, we will be more uh, talking about uh, the ethnographic and uh, you know, uh, anthropological uh, perspectives of the existing uh, indigenous peoples. So first of our speaker will be Yulia Alieva. Um, she's an instructor of social sciences at ADA University at Baku, and she teaches courses of introduction to sociology and gender race minorities, these two courses. In parallel, she is doing her PhD research at Philips University Marburg of Germany on religious education in Azerbaijan. Um, Yulia received her MA in gender studies from Central European University uh, of Budapest and her BA from BA in international relations from Academy of Public and, uh, Administration under the President of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Um, today, Yulia will share with us certain conceptual and theoretical framework of diversity and politics of multiculturalism from rather sociological, maybe anthropological perspective and how it is applied in the case of Azerbaijan in general. So I'm giving the floor to our first speaker, Yulia Alieva. Okay. Um, so again, you know, the, the topic uh, that we are going to be covering today is rather broad. And, you know, it's so multidimensional. That's why I was having real struggles in putting, you know, my presentation together. And I was thinking mainly like uh, from a local perspective, like what people in Azerbaijan probably would love to hear about multicultural, where it stands for, and you know, how actually the debates which are going worldwide are uh, anyhow reflected in our local perspective. Yeah, so kind of, uh, again, you know, this is gonna be just very brief, you know, and very superficial probably a presentation around this uh, kind of concept. Uh, and um, um, so why multiculturalism? Yeah, so I think that multiculturalism, first of all, refers to this term, this notion of diversity, right? So um, in general, it uh, has been envisioned as some kind of normative ideal, you know, or kind of, you know, this um, ideal case, you know, in Weberian terms, you know, some kind of envisioning uh, some kind of considering uh, how minority groups, you know, or other groups that uh, are uh, not sharing culture uh, can be incorporated into broader societies. And uh, at the same time, how to help them to um, keep uh, their distinctive uh, collective identities and practices. Yeah, so that's kind of the primary challenge. And, you know, this primary, again, this normative ideal, you know, and how various scholars were envisioning, you know, how we actually, we would manage to build these kind of societies. Um, so again, they were trying to address this question, how to understand and respond to challenges associated with cultural diversity. And, you know, um, I think it's really hard to find um, any homogeneous societies, like it was really hard to find these homogeneous societies through the history of the humanity, because, uh, you know, people were always on the move, you know, there were so many waves of migration and, you know, even uh, for various reasons, the societies were splitting apart, you know, the same communities, you know, for certain reason they were splitting. So, you know, again, uh, there was always this challenge of cultural diversity. It was always present. And so I think, um, Although the concept of multiculturalism is somehow a new concept, you know, it was present, you know, since the kind of creations of humanity with, with us. But, you know, probably it was just named differently in different kind of, you know, um, stages. Um, but again, so coming back to multiculturalism, I think um, we need to know that, you know, acknowledge that the, this concept is highly contested, you know, and there are different Again, as Mirka Ranbai mentioned, you know, different interpretations of it, different approaches to this concept, even different schools, you know, related to this concept. Within the discipline, there are different perspectives. Uh, on the other hand, it's highly contextual. So it's very bounded to certain geographical regions, you know, to some 
uh, narratives, you know, that exist in those regions. And, uh, but I think all of that, you know, they, it share this uh, one central premise and that it's contrasted with assimilationist ideas. Yeah, so kind of there is this dichotomy of multiculturalism, like preservation of this diversity uh, versus assimilation. Um, as uh, so, just to brief history again, you know, um, of course, uh, the kind of the current understanding of multicultures is very closely related with this so-called politics of identity that started, you know, in 1960s, mostly in Western countries, and it was again political movement for greater inclusion of different marginalized groups. You know, you know, these processes were taking place in the United States, in Canada, in all other countries. And uh, the major concern of contemporary multiculturalism is uh, this, um, are these immigrants um, who are ethnic or religious minorities, for instance, like Latino people in the United States or Muslim as Western Europe, uh, some minority nations, sorry, I need to go back, yeah. Alas, I don't know, Basque, Catalans, Quebecers, uh, indigenous people, you know, the people who are native, who are living on those territories, like in Canada, in US, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, but uh, the current discourse also includes some other marginalized groups, including white women, LGBTQ people, and people with disabilities. So all these people um, are also want to be included, you know, they want to be, uh, their voices to be heard. And uh, this creates, you know, this um, uh, multi this makes this multicultural discourse as kind of so multi vocal. Yeah. So it, it has a whole spectrum, you know, of all these different uh, representations and interests. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to focus just on two major um, kind of debates on two major concepts related to multiculturalism. Again, it relates mostly to Western concepts. And that's a uh, diversification of school curricula to recognize the achievements, you know, and also incorporate these marginalized groups. And then a uh, political and ideological movement, which is focusing on inclusive citizenship. So um, for instance, um, I am teaching uh, introductions of sociology in university and I was surprised, for instance, I, um, I am teaching using the textbook, which is uh, kind of was written by two authors a Canadian and uh, American sociologists. And so they are focusing on multicultures entirely and uh, only as um, kind of from the perspective of education. You know, they have the so-called subchapter on multicultures, and so they are discussing only uh, this perspective. And so they have, are offering to the students only this definition. Uh, that multiculturalism is the view that the curriculum of public schools and colleges should reflect I don't know how to. Uh, a country's ethnic and racial diversity and recognize the equality of all cultures. Um, yeah, and so in the United States, for instance, um, kind of this trend, you know, uh, brought uh, to this reconceptual reconceptualization of school curricula and. Um, uh, kind of to, uh, so that it's gonna highlight the achievements of non-whites and non-Europeans, because previously, you know, it was extremely Eurocentric. Uh, then another issue that they brought into kind of the discussion, you know, into these textbooks is more recognition to the way European settlers came to dominate non-white and non-European communities. You know, there is this. Uh, Columbus Day, you know, which is celebrated in the United States, which is day of um, kind of huge celebrations are hold. Uh, but nowadays, many people are questioning that. And so it's not just um, Columbus Day, you know, which is being celebrated, but also the day of indigenous peoples. Yeah, because uh, it's believed that, you know, uh, kind of for many years, you know, the narrative in the schools were presented as if uh, European colonizers uh, uh, appeared and they came to the United States uh, at that point, of course, just kind of to the North America. And that was an empty land. Yeah, nobody was living there and they just started living, you know, and uh, cultivating, you know, and bringing, uh, building their communities. 
And of course, you know, there was another side, another part of the story, another part of the narrative of these indigenous people who, of course, tremendously suffered and, you know, were almost even exterminated. Yeah. And so these narratives were basically were not present, but now they are being included. Um, yes, then it's also to kind of include this narrative about racial domination, you know, and why actually it takes place, why it happened that, you know, it has these roots uh, within the persistent social inequalities. Uh, moreover, you know, uh, it's possible also in the United States to um, receive uh, at least elementary level education in Spanish language in certain states, in certain states, for instance, in this uh, kind of uh, southern states, um, all the public announcements, for instance, announcements in the um, in airports are also conducted into languages, yeah, kind of in English and in Spanish. Uh, in Britain, uh, the kind of there were the similar uh, tendencies, the similar trends, you know, to um, uh, incorporate, you know, all this multicultural agenda to the schools. And uh, I think uh, there, you know, what was different that the state also uh, provided funding to some denominational schools so that, for instance, students can go and take some courses as extracurricular courses, you know, so, but it was all state sponsored. Uh, and uh, I know that there were also debates related to kind of wide range of accommodation at schools related to particular dress codes or even diets. And this is actually, yeah, kind of this uh, is a poster kind of, um, I took a picture with uh, when I was in the United States while visiting one of the elementary schools. And so um, kind of once you enter in, you see this big poster, which actually signifies and which kind of gives the students a message about kind of uh, how they need to be uh, kind of the, how they need to be treated and how they uh, have to treat others. Um, but and I think here it's not just about multicultural and treating uh, different uh, people, you know, resembling different cultures, but it's also about individualistic uh, values that, you know, we are all different, you know, we are all um, individuals on our own, you know, and we just need to respect one another. And uh, we just need to learn how to live all together in the same box. Uh, and then uh, I think the second um, side of the coin, yeah, which I'm going to discuss, of course, there are many dimensions, but, you know, again, for the sake of time, I'm going to focus just on this one. It's a question of citizenship, yeah, and so some uh, political and ideological movements which are associated with this. And so or I believe kind of one of the major questions that uh, still exist in um, kind of in Western countries and in many countries and including, I think, Azerbaijan is this question of citizenship. So for instance, uh, if we are talking about multicultural rights or multicultural recognition, uh, is this formal citizenship is a prerequisite of access to these rights? Well, that's not necessary because Again, some of the people, for some of the people, this citizenship is unattainable, then doesn't mean that they just gonna be excluded, they just gonna be marginalized, you know, within the social context. Um, then uh, I think another debate it goes on around this um, kind of civil society, you know, and the processes within the civil society and creation of the so-called ethno-religious groups. Um, who are emphasizing their core identity, I don't know, be it kind of sort of religious identity or ethnic identity as a mobilizing factor. You know, they are saying, okay, so they are hoping, you know, that people who are sharing uh, their identity, you know, they're gonna vote, you know, and then uh, this actually gonna lead for greater re representation of them on national or kind of local level. So here again, uh, representation is not for the sake of, I don't know, like, Mm, some ideological or political agenda, but just, you know, because people belong to certain ethno-religious groups. So I know that, again, this is also kind of the source of certain debates. Uh, and uh, the last kind of point, you know, of uh, this discussion around this issue of um, inclusive citizenship relates to the judicial system, you know, and uh, to my knowledge, at least in Canada or in Britain, 
there were these precedents when um, certain um, it no a kind of certain laws or certain legal judgments were ruled um, in interests of uh, some ethnocultural groups. Uh, so they were exempt from certain requirements because it was at odds with their, their religion or culture. And so again, there is this ongoing debate whether this is something good or something bad. Um, and in general, uh, I think like there was a serious back against uh, multiculturalism by the end of uh, kind of 2010, you know, beginning of uh, that decade. Um, and uh, I think like when I'm uh, talking to people, it's, it's especially in Azerbaijan, I think uh, there is certain misconception. Yeah, so there is this misconception that multi multiculturalism completely failed and so it's no longer part of uh, the agenda, you know, um, in many countries, especially, you know, this uh, liberal Western countries. And they are kind of holding, trying to hold it back. Uh, but I think uh, still uh, their kind of these policies, you know, they, they uh, still manage to achieve, you know, certain results. They are still there. Uh, but uh, some of these results were questionable, yeah, and so they, of course, they become the source of critique. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you know they completely um, kind of question, you know, this idea or the concept uh, which exists out there. Uh, for instance, if we are talking about uh, this um, idea of multicultures in education. Uh, again, it faced serious. It was kind of uh, faced with serious critique. I believe, especially like in Canadian context, but also to a certain extent in the United States. Um, basically, like I Brim and Lee explore, explained, for three major reasons. Like um, because uh, it believed that uh, the students actually from marginalized community they um, were not performing that well in the schools. And uh, by introduction of these additional burdens and by introduction of these additional subjects, you know, on learning their kind of these native cultures, they were distracted from essential subjects. So they were actually having um, much more harder workload in, compares, in comparison with their peers, you know, and this was actually something that uh, was questioned that in, for them in order to perform better, you know, they would rather need to focus on, I don't know, English language and math rather than studying, you know, what uh, was going on within their communities or, you know, studying Spanish language and things like that. Um, then uh, the second point of critique, I think it is more uh, prominent is that it encourages conflicts. So um, people kind of become then so much concentrated on these negative elements, you know, all this about uh, this level uh, elements of uh, racial inequality, about the conflict that existed uh, between indigenous populations and colonizers. So it's kind of makes students to reflect too much about all these negative things. And uh, this may provoke conflicts nowadays, you know, this hostility between uh, the students. And so again, um, kind of the, alternative approach would be to stress kind of the common elements of the national experience, you know, that, you know, uh, actually there were times when people were coming together and building, you know, these uh, beautiful countries. But again, there is this ongoing bit, like how much uh, of information students need, yeah, and what kind of information, how to present this information so that they will not project whatever negative experience they are um, ancestors were having on everyday reality nowadays. And again, the kind of the final point, uh, point is that it also encourages cultural relativism that, you know, that uh, all cultures are of the same value, you know, and all cultures need to be respected. And then, you know, there's again this ongoing discussion about liberal versus no liberal values, uh, democratic versus non democratic values. So, can we actually bring them, you know, to the table or we actually need to question? So again, it's very complex talk. So I just want to move on um, to the next point of critique and that's uh, the feminist voices again. And so they were also the ones that were actually pointing to this 
uh, issue of um, cultural relativism and incom incompatibility of values, you know, that uh, may exist across uh, different communities. Yeah, for instance, um, if um, we claim that all values, uh, all communities are of the same value uh, and all traditions need to be respected, then how to treat such traditions as polygamy, uh, female genital mutilation, forced marriages? So do we also need kind of to close uh, eyes, you know, on violation of women's rights? Or should we rather question that, you know, and try uh, to um, anyhow negotiate, you know, all of these kind of negative instances within kind of this universal framework, you know, say of women's rights, of human rights. Uh, and another, the second point of critique of multicultural, which was coming from feminists, but that uh, still multicultural and this idea, it creates certain hierarchy. Uh, so it creates uh, this impression that um, there are kind of some kind of superior cultures, you know, these Western cultures, and then there are inferior cultures, the in cultures that, let's say, belong to these migrant communities or these indigenous communities, uh, which are represented quite often very stereotypical, you know, in stereotypical manner. So um, then kind of how to switch that, how to challenge this narrative? Yeah, and so kind of uh, one of the feminist authors, uh, Anne Phillips, in her book on Multicultures Without Culture, uh, she was claiming that, you know, it's time for elaborating a new a version of multiculturalism that uh, dispenses with uh, reified notions of culture, engages more ruthlessly with cultural stereotypes, and refuses to subordinate the rights and interests of women to the supposed traditions of their culture. Yeah, so I think here the final uh, phrase that it's supposed traditions is one of the keys. Yeah, that quite often what we take as real actually is not something real, but you know, these are reinvented traditions, which kind of might be questioned even within those communities. And this leads us to the next kind of point of critique, and that's the critique of in general, kind of once we say multiculturalism, we suppose that there are multicultures. But what is culture per se? Yeah, so are we treating them cultures as monoliths? Uh, are we treating them as kind of this sole unity? Because again, um, it's mostly um, uh, kind of open-ended concept, you know, and then within all of the cultures, you're going to find some critical voices, you know, some subcultures. Um, yeah, well, like, I think it was very um, kind of uh, well, very nicely explained by Sela Ben Habib, you know, when she was uh, pointing to this reduction in sociology of culture, you know, that essentializing this idea of belonging um to like culture as belonging to certain um group within very rigid boundaries and kind of this idea of culture as a monolith i think leads me to the last point you know on critique you know to this uh idea of multicultures and that's uh, the um, ideal groupism and uh it was um um, kind of formulated by Rogers Brubaker in his uh, kind of uh, very well-known essay, Ethnicity Without Groups, uh, where he is saying that, um, yeah, in general, kind of, uh, if we take, for instance, ethnicity, uh, it's kind of very useful category for social analysis, but is it real? Yeah, so if we agree that, you know, we're going to employ this social constructionist position, then how to study all of this, how to approach this, you know, if we think of this as uh, some kind of social construction. Um, yeah, and so he points to this era of groupism, uh, the tendency to take a discrete, sharply differentiated, internally homogeneous and externally bound groups as basic constituents of social life, chief protagonists of social conflict and fundamental units of social analysis. Um, yes, so again, um, Brubaker is saying that it makes more sense to think about groupness as an event, as something that happens, uh, something that happens just through the life of the history, 
and uh, kind of there is always this risk, there is always this um, problems that kind of ascribing certain issues or certain um, um, kind of conflicts to this problem of um, kind of clashes, you know, of civilizations or some uh, cultural blocks, uh, whereas maybe there are some other reasons behind. You know, um, there is this famous uh, uh, anthropologist, I forgot um, her name, uh, uh, who is doing research on Dagestan. And for instance, uh, I've listened to a couple of her presentation where she is always pointing that for instance, there uh, quite often the narratives are presented that you know there is this clashes between some um, ethnic groups, you know, within you know that region of Russia. But whereas in reality, actually there is so much of um, economic disparity that is in, involved, and so it actually often plays much more important role. Okay, so this was again very brief and very again superficial entrance and kind of this uh, uh, this debate about multiculturalism, and um, now I just gonna arrive to this topic um, and how it's uh, reflected in Azerbaijan, uh, and you know it's kind of um, there's no uh, question you know it's widely accepted that uh, we are having uh, ethnic religious and cultural diversity in Azerbaijan um, and it was something that you know existed on this territory for centuries if not thousands of years uh, so as uh, Mirka Marian was pointing you know at the beginning yes so this was mostly about uh, indigenous groups yeah, but maybe sometimes not all, not only, but also of some groups that arrived later. For instance, uh, there are going to be a presentation on um, uh, German communities here in Azerbaijan. Uh, and uh, again, one of the issues, you know, when uh, talking about these issues, you know, about uh, kind of this concept in Azerbaijan uh, is not to fall into this idea of groupism because. Again, if we're gonna be approaching this, let's say, from um, the perspective of uh, religious communities, uh, we would also need to acknowledge and understand that uh, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, let's say, they are not homogenous in Azerbaijan. You know, there are some um, kind of many trends in Islam. You know, kind of uh, not just two of these major um, <clears throat> sects of um, uh, Shia and Sunni, but also. Uh, some other, you know, some <clears throat> of them arrived quite um, lately. Um, then, you know, let's say uh, in, in Christianity, you know, there are so many so-called kind of traditional Christian groups, Orthodox Christians, and then this newly um, uh, new evangelical communities. Let's say there are at least three uh, communities that I am aware of of um, Jewish people. You know, the Sephardic Jews. Um, Ashkenazi Jews and Georgian Jews. So it makes all these communities already non homogeneous. You know, they, there is already diversity within all these diverse communities. So um, I think that that's one of the issues that uh, our communities are becoming more diversified and more, uh, there is more pluralization that is going on. Um, excuse me, Yulia, uh, if, you, if you can uh, go to the conclusion. Yeah, so yeah, I apologize. Yeah, I don't see the time. Yeah, and so um, uh, then um, the politics of multiculturalism that we are having in Azerbaijan, you know, it's mostly focusing on ethnic and religious communities. Uh, and uh, quite often it's defined as a third way, you know, that we are actually having this. Uh, third way, you know, which is more uh, inclusive in comparison, like whatever they are having in the West. And uh, there are, of course, certain benefits for multicultural cultures in Azerbaijan, you know, and that includes some um, legal, liberal legal framework, you know, that, you know, for instance, uh, there are some programs in the support of ethno religious cultural groups, you know, uh, our school curriculum is reconceptualized. Um, kind of, there is great inclusion nowadays we are seeing of religious communities, uh, but at the same time, there are some minuses, you know, which are involved in this um, kind of 
approach. And I think uh, one of the major issues that I want to address is that it's a very top-down approach. So it's very formal and institutional. And it's so much focused on these issues uh, that, you know, we have tolerance in Azerbaijan, that, you know, that there is this issue of uh, coexistence. Um, but again, when we are talking, let's say, about tolerance, so total, who is tolerating whom? And who actually is um, forced, you know, to live together with other communities and just accept them? Yeah. So, Again, there is this kind of hierarchy which is created within this kind of master narrative that we are having now. And so for me, again, like from, uh, again, we can have this, again, policy or uh, kind of government perspective, but I think we as um, researchers, we would need rather to recon uh, reconceptualize it, yeah, and maybe try to find some uh, better uh, frameworks to address, you know, the developments which are taking place on the ground. And for that, I was thinking that maybe I would kind of suggest this term of conviviality, you know, this um, another term, you know, that actually is focusing on some experiences of coexistence as a way of life. So it's kind of the way of like this, Denis Duru is defining this as ways of both sharing and contesting particular lifestyles in a place through daily interactions and a sense of belonging. Uh, for instance, when I was, I'm doing my um, fieldwork in Azerbaijan and usually I do this uh, on this so-called uh, small, some maybe even marginalized communities like religious groups, uh, the first thing that people are sharing with me is some kind of positive attitudes that they were having some positive experiences and uh, sharing, you know, with uh, local communities and other communities, uh, some of the positive events that were happening, some positive experiencing. And um, I just want to finish on this uh, with this photo that I just saw uh, two days ago, um, kind of you know, in uh, Facebook in one of the groups. Uh, really kind of dedicated to culinary. And so uh, a woman posted this uh, photo of how she's opening iftar. And you can see it's kind of this uh, Easter bread, you know, kind of what we are calling coolidge, uh, along with some um, halwa, you know, which is kind of common for this. So it's kind of show this blendery, yeah, kind of mixture of all these uh, religious uh, traditions. You know, and I think it's very nicely, again, um, illustrate the concept of conviviality, you know, that I think it's kind of much more appropriate for our context rather than multiculturalism. My understanding is, Yulia, you are, um, you know, um, you are mapping Azerbaijani case within the term conviviality rather than multiculturalism, because multiculturalism is more of a policy uh, but conviviality is more about coexistence or peaceful coexistence of different ethnic, cultural, and national communities altogether. So that's why uh, you are mapping it as, as a term called conviviality, which um, means peaceful coexistence or coexistence of the different uh, diverse cultural and ethnic groups altogether. Um, okay, now we are going to move to the next speaker. Um, uh, our next speaker will be um, Dr. Sevinj Nasirova. Uh, so Sevinj, uh, I, I believe Sevinj is with us. Sevinj worked as the chief of the ethnographic fund in the National Museum of History of Azerbaijan. And currently she, she is working as the scientific secretary of the National Museum. Her research covers the daily household of Azerbaijanis, especially weaving crafts and ornaments on the weaving samples. She received her doctorate in, dissert in dissertation topic called um, the, the patterns on the weaving materials as the ethnographic source. And today she is going to discuss about uh, some of those samples uh, that belongs to the Azerbaijani Jews. Uh, and those samples are right now in the collection of the National Museum of History of Azerbaijan. So Dr. Sevinj Nasirova, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mir Kamran. First of all, I want to greet everyone and to say my thanks to Caucasus through Time Network, especially to Narmin, uh, for uh, Narmin's and Aslan's patient and understanding um, and organizing this meeting. Um, 
the samples of material culture belonging to Azerbaijani Jews in the collection of the National Museum of History of Azerbaijan. Uh, I would like uh, to show my presentation, um, just a minute. And um, Azerbaijan is one of the countries that has exemplified the values of multiculturalism in the 21st century, where many ethnic groups live uh, together. Uh, as you know, Azerbaijan is situated in the South Caucasus, uh, and, and um, um, there are settled a lot of more than uh, 15 um, ethnic groups. And this country is constantly implementing an action plan, not only uh, for the livelihood of different peoples, but also um, for the development of their cultures. A clear example of this is announcement of uh, 2016's year as uh, the year of multiculturalism in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is a country of rich, cultural and spiritual heritage and traditions of tolerance. Today, this trust is recognized uh, on an international area. Azerbaijan successfully continues the traditions of coexistence. Equal conditions are created for all uh, peoples, regardless of religion or language, or uh, to promote their culture. Uh, there are three religious representatives, as you know, um, uh, there are uh, Muslims, um, Christianity and Judaism in Azerbaijan. And uh, one of the ethnic groups living in Azerbaijan are Jews. Uh, they settled here in the three groups, uh, mountain Jews. Um, there is two um, ideas with their settlement. Uh, one of them says that they are uh, settled from the beginning of 16th century, uh, 16th century, and the other one is uh, after Gulistan Street, uh, after um, 18, uh, 13 year. And um, the other group is, uh, so I want to say that um, mountain Jews are also called uh, Caucasus Jews too. Ashkenazi and Georgian Jews. Uh, Georgian Jews um, are uh, fewer than uh, other groups. Jews, they live uh, compact in Guba, in Gurmuzi Gasebe, if to translate, it's Red Village. Uh, they live more compact in this village in Guba. There are a total of seven synagogues in Azerbaijan, um, two in Guba, uh, where they live compact, two in Oghuz, and four of synagogues uh, situated in Baku, in the capital of Azerbaijan. Uh, the most famous of Azerbaijani Jews are Albert Agarunov, Bela Davidovich, um, El Lalea, Lev Landau, and uh, others. Uh, and especially, I would like to say that, uh, as Aslan said in the beginning, that uh, the National Museum of History of Azerbaijan is one of the oldest museums in Azerbaijan. Well, I've got a, a very nice collection. And in this collection, we have uh, got um, the samples, the exhibit of uh, ethnic groups, too. And uh, as you see, I would like to show uh, the photo. Uh, this photo made in 1936 and uh, the photo of Jewish woman in traditional uh, dress. Uh, it's from our museum's collection and dress uh, what the other dresses from Ethnography Fund. Uh, they are um, named um, Goba. Uh, and the other uh, photo, the accessory to fasten the front of the um, uh, uh, front of the dress, uh, as you see, it's same on uh, dress and on photo, which made in 1936. And except it, the accessories are very interesting. Uh, as you know, uh, Jewish uh, have got uh, especially uh, six-pointed um, uh, star. Uh, it's their uh, like religious. Um, religious accessoire and uh, as you see the woman uh, has got such a, an accessoire. Uh, I would like to say that this photo made in Gurmuzi Gaseba where uh, Jewish live compactly and uh, the other dress uh, it's red dress uh, especially I want to say that in Azerbaijan uh, the ethnic groups too the local people too wear the, uh, wear the uh, red dresses uh, before of course globalization and the influence of European culture uh, at the special times as wedding and uh, such uh, um, 
process. The long shirt uh, uh, wearing under the guba, it was wearing uh, under the guba dress, the long shirt uh, uh, and the, the men's beshmet kind uh, of wear in Caucasus, uh, it's different of uh, Caucasus beshmet because Caucasus beshmet shorter than uh, this one, uh, this especially uh, for uh, Jewish uh, men. And uh, uh, I would like to say that um, especially women clothes uh, and long shirts called Guba dominate the college. As you see, there are uh, photos of Guba Jewish uh, women in those clothes in the photo negative materials fund of the museum. Jewish women's clothing, accessories, and photographs, uh, especially and earrings, as you saw uh, in this present. Uh, no, we have not got this photo, sorry, uh, are preserved in photos, uh, which made also in Selin, do you hear us? Selin? I think, I think there is technical problem. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, now it's okay. You can continue. Uh, yeah, and uh, we have got photos uh, also made in 1936, uh, Jewish women also in Guba, uh, in Gurmaze Kasaba, uh, and the uh, and the landscape of Gurmuz Gasebe, Jewish site of Bazaar uh, in Guba, uh, it changed a little bit now, uh, more modern now. And uh, the religious uh, exhibits of, uh, from our museum, uh, the religious exhibits of uh, the museum are Tiflin, Talit, um, especially Tiflis. I would like to um, say something about this Tiflis. Uh, the collection also includes several uh, kippahs, prayer shows, and Tiflin uh, philasteries, uh, which are considered re considered religious uh, clothing. Tiflin, also called philasters, as you see, are two small cubic black uh, leather boxes that contain verses from the Torah. They are worn on the head and on uh, one arm and uh, are held in place by leather straps in accordance with the line of uh, determinary that reads and you shall and you shall bind them as a sign upon your hand and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. Uh, observant means uh, and boys who have had their bar mitzvah uh, uh, usually wear tiflin on their head and their arm during uh, during um, weekday morning prayer, uh, especially I would like to say about Bar Mitzvah. Bar Mitzvah uh, is uh, when the uh, boys uh, are already 13 years and one day, uh, uh, and the girls, when they are 20 years and one day, uh, they are already considered uh, like Bar Mitzvah. So they can, um, they can have their um, religious, uh, I think, worldwide, uh, and uh, such a kind of um, bar, mitzvah, bar mitzvah is um, responsible. They are responsible, the boys uh, and the girls, when they are already responsible for the religious decision. Uh, so, um, uh, and uh, women do not usually wear tiflin through this practice is changing. Of course, uh, the globalization, modernization makes some changes uh, to the religious world war too. And, um, maybe there is already a woman who wear uh, tiflin. And uh, the hand tiflin has all four texts uh, written on a single parchment strip, but the head tiflin uh, has four separate compartments with a single text in each. The Jewish men start uh, wearing tiflin just before, as I said, in their bar mitzvah, a little uh, back for tiflin, as you see, uh, with Hebrew inscriptions on it, also preserved in museum. And this, uh, uh, the uh, picture or photo, how uh, uh, the young people or uh, the Jewish people wear the tiflin to their head and to their arm. 
And uh, the second uh, religious um, exhibits from our museum are kippahs. Kippah, it's uh, this brime, brimeless cap uh, and the wearing of a double head covering the kippah or yarmuke, yameke, and a hat among uh, the orthodox or a skull cap uh, only by orthodox Jews involved the, in 19th century Europe and became part of the um, part of the controversy between reformists and traditional uh, groups. Among some of the reformists, the school cap um, is worn during prayer and other ceremonial associations. Many Jews feel that by wearing a skull cap, um, they are proud they are nothing to the world that they are Jewish. Uh, this is classed as an uh, outward sign of their face. Uh, it has also become custom uh, to wear kippahs or yarmulkes of certain colors. As you see, we have got two uh, colored kippahs. One of them is blue and white. And um, uh, size and materials can uh, change uh, as a sign of allegiance to a certain group. There are two kippahs in museum collection, one of them uh, as I said, uh, blue and other is white. And the Talit. Talit uh, is the next uh, religious exhibit from our museum. It is um, a fringed garment worn as a prayer show by religious Jews and Samaritans. Uh, you can see in all photos of religious Jews, the kippah, tiflin, and uh, this Talit uh, show together. Uh, they were worn together. And uh, that's all uh, what I wanted to show from our uh, museum. And if you have got some questions about uh, Jewish in Azerbaijan or how they live or uh, about their cul uh, culture, uh, please. Um, Sevinj, I have my own question. Uh, yes. So I'm wondering, because I've seen Baku people there in Kippa. Uh, so the, the same Kippas, maybe it might be different in terms of ornaments, but uh, I've seen people at least wearing kippa, but I haven't seen uh, the, the 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 Ashkenazi like, you know, cap. Like what, what is it? Uh, Ashkenazi hats. People like I haven't seen that much in Baku. Uh, maybe it's like you no know, uh, not that widespread in amongst the Bakuvian Jews. Um, do you have any information about like you no know, Ashkenazi in Baku? In, yes, they? you know me, Cameron. Uh, as I said, uh, I have already said that in the beginning that uh, there are three groups uh, in Azerbaijan: Guba Jews, uh, Ashkenazi, and Georgian Jews. Uh, especially the materials uh, which we have got uh, from Guba and uh, from Baku, but we have not got some ornamental uh, kippas. We have got just only um, without any ornament kippas, and uh, of course maybe they. They have got, um, uh, for example, as I said, um, if to um, uh, take uh, an example from Tiflin's, for example, now uh, maybe the woman uh, wear a Tiflin too, but uh, before um, there was not uh, uh, there was not any um, of such uh, practice, uh, only men wear uh, the uh, kippa, uh, tiflins. And uh, what about kippas? Uh, for example, when I was in Gernze Gaseba, I didn't see uh, ornamental kippas. I saw such kind of kippas which uh, are preserved in our museum. But maybe, of course, um, there is uh, because they are very uh, different uh, in the kippas in Azerbaijan. But it is what we have got. I that's what uh, the, that that is in in the museum i see okay thank you so much uh Sevinj, for your insights uh is uh doing her phd on the topic of domestic life of ethnic groups in azerbaijan and her research covers ethnic minorities in azerbaijan where you know she has done several ethnographic re uh, surveys on minority regions in the country uh today she is going to talk about uh one of the uh, national minorities that used to live in Azerbaijan, like historic German settlements in the western parts of the country. Uh, so uh, now I'm giving the floor to Sara. Sara, floor is yours. Thanks, I'm Sanadova. Uh, thank you for uh, invitation and for such uh, interesting uh, seminar. And today, um, I want uh, to talk about uh, just Germans because our other speakers told uh, about uh, multiculturalism, uh, about other uh, ethnic groups and minorities. That's why just I uh, 
just to talk about uh, Germans, uh, how they lived here, why they came here, about some samples uh, which are kept in our museum. Uh, as a way, I am also an, an employer of National Museum of History of Azerbaijan. And just, um, I want to share my uh, presentation too, but just, uh, uh, just um, interesting that um, it's about 19th century and 19th century is one of the complicated period of the history of not only in uh, Europe but also in Caucasus. That's why uh, we can uh, just uh, can uh, journey uh, to make a journey to that period because it was a uh, in, uh, it, it was so um, hard period in Europe. There was a Napoleonic war and um, people are in uh, hard, difficult uh, conditions. People lived in difficult conditions. At the same time, it was in period of imperial Russia. And you know that uh, at that time, historical territory of Azerbaijan divided to, were divided to parts. And uh, North Azerbaijan were uh, under control of imperial Russia. That's why we can say that not only Azerbaijanis, but also um, Russians, a different uh, uh, nations lived here at that time and it's uh, at that time can you, uh, um, and uh, can you mm -hmm. a bit maybe maximize your screen so we can see the full of your presentation do you, do you know what i'm getting uh, at? i don't know you can see or, or not because i, I did, cannot I see uh, the presentation see. but if you mm -hmm. uh, you know make it a slide in a slide format we can see it like you know much better like yeah right. yeah thank you thank you Okay. And uh, the firstly, uh, they had believed that uh, a German uh, people uh, believed that maybe uh, they can uh, migrate and in this way they can live in peace because uh, Napoleonic War devastated Germany and south part of Germany, people from south part of Germany, we say it Wittenberg, uh, called as a Wittenberg, and they uh, wanted to migrate uh, and to live in the different parts of Imperial Russia and uh, actually mainly in Caucasus. Uh, and then um, you know that Alexander the first Emperor of Russia at that time uh, the Congress in Vienna and he was in Stuttgart and when he was there and people um, uh, people built him and asked to uh, allow him uh, allow them to move uh, inside of Caucasus that's why in this way um, about 500 people uh, began to move from uh, Germany through Ukraine uh, inside of Europe. And uh, firstly, but it's interesting that they firstly uh, arrived to Georgia, we say now um, Tbilisi, and the first uh, German settlement, it's called uh, Marienfeld, was created near Tbilisi. It's a village of Sartichala. And uh, then uh, you know that the lack of territory, people had to leave and people needed uh, land. Uh, for a settlement. And then um, they began to move inside of uh, Azerbaijan. At that time, actually, we know that there was not a term Azerbaijan, which there was some districts under the name of Yelizavetov, for example. And they began to move inside. Uh, we call this territory now, we say Ganja, for example. But before it was called um, Yelizavetov uh, district. And they Firstly, uh, settled in, um, uh, we say now, sometimes it's called Helenantorf, sometimes Yelenantorf, it, it depends on uh, pronunciation, and um, they chose uh, the territory of modern Gögel. It's called Helenendorf. And then uh, another Azerbaijan town, uh, Shemkir. It was called Anenfeld. Actually, we can say that it is a, came the, um, uh, the names of, um, I mean, it came the, uh, they use these two lands, but uh, completely they were uh, established eight uh, German colonies in whole Caucasus, but two of them were inside Azerbaijan. One of them was Helenandorf, we now call it as, a, as Gogol, as uh, other one was um, um, Shemkir, we say Anenfeld. Actually, uh, they uh, when they came here, of course, it was so hard period, and from these old photos, we can see uh, how they uh, um, try to um, uh, build their houses, how they want to um, create uh, create new life here and to provide their life with different uh, under different conditions. Um, but uh, it is uh, interesting that they came here, they began to live here and they began to search different ways 
to continue their life. Um, actually, um, first of all, of course, they created their um, schools here, their, uh, I mean, um, under the name, uh, I mean, just, uh, it was not just a um, migration, just a living in this territory. Uh, there were, were different, uh, I mean, different uh, purposes. First of all, they believed that they can live in this here. Another way, uh, Russia, it was a, one of the policies of Imperial Russia. In this way, uh, they just uh, believe, they just say that, uh, say that they, in this way, German people can help Azerbaijan people for create a new agricultural uh, techniques, for example, we can say, but uh, it's news that Azerbaijan had uh, uh, has uh, ancient uh, traditions about agriculture and different uh, fields, and uh, in this way they came here and they created own, uh, they built their own, I mean, um, houses, own. Um, uh, roads and different uh, important, uh, I mean, uh, uh, buildings. But uh, I want to talk about one uh, interesting thing. Um, why it, the, um, the main part of their um, occupation was uh, viticulture, wine making. And why viticulture, why wine making? Because um, uh, archaeological, uh, archaeological uh, findings also prove that this territory, we say, uh, we call it as a Gögel during Soviet period, it was called Hanlar. And that Helenendorf was one of the ancient uh, place where uh, during archaeological excavations the uh, seeds of grape were found from the different uh, ancient uh, uh, regions. That's why they also, when they came here, they have seen it and they clear them, they can uh, invest uh, on this uh, territory. In this way, they can create different factories, fabrics under the name of wine companies, different wine companies. And people who began to live here, um, family, different families, families, and um, began to live here. They uh, decided to open these factories because you know that uh, at that time the main group of population were Muslims and they had not interest in this field. That's why, firstly, they uh, they uh, decided to uh, create these wine factories here. Actually, uh, there were different family groups. One of them was uh, called uh, Forer Brothers, other one Hummel Brothers. They firstly created their wine factory in 1860 in. Uh, Gögel region, and um, uh, it was one of the important even in the history of Azerbaijan because we had uh, wine, uh, I mean, wine uh, um, tradition, wine making traditions, of course, uh, viticulture traditions of uh, facts prove these uh, 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 sorts, but uh, to create fun factory uh, and to create industry in this field, it, uh, we can uh, say that it became uh, with the coming of Germans to this territory. They, um, when we talk about them, uh, it, uh, we, we just uh, can think that it was not only just uh, industry or some uh, factory creation of some factories or fabrics. They began to live here. They began to create own schools, own uh, temp uh, church, for example. Uh, and even these people began to take part in uh, administration. For example, when Azerbaijan declared its independence in 18, 1918, uh, the first democratic republic, uh, in uh, when it was uh, it happened uh, from the uh, German uh, community, there was also people. Uh, it was uh, he was called uh, Loris Kuhn, and he also uh, was a member of that parliament when it was created. That's why um, it was really important. And then they had uh, interesting power on um, um, uh, during uh, Russia. Imperial Russia, and not only uh, that uh, wine company, in 1920s there was created uh, a Concordia uh, wine, uh, wine uh, factory. It was a really important uh, wine, uh, wine factory because um, uh, not only in, inside Imperial Russia, even Europe, uh, they were uh, famous. Uh, Concordia had 183 um, brands in the different parts of Imperial Russia and Europe. And this fact also shows that uh, really wine making and viticulture was took a special uh, place in um, agriculture of German people. Uh, and uh, one more, uh, this, uh, if you can see that bottle, uh, it's 
is this bottle is kept in uh, our museum in ethnography fund uh, um, actually they are, they have they had different uh, factories but unfortunately we have less material which belongs to german people one of them is here um, but before uh, in the beginning of the um, topic, I said that brothers folk can uh, read that word from the it's uh, one branch in Baku. Uh, all of uh, factory were firstly created in Helenendorf. Now we say Gogol, but they had a lot of branch in Baku, in Moscow, in uh, the, even in Ukraine, different parts of uh, Russia. Uh, that's why uh, one branch in, in Baku. Unfortunately, we have some photos. Uh, which belong to them uh, and this uh, this is about i told you that concordia uh, wine company it's really was so important all of wine producers united under one uh, company to uh, produce and uh, to produce their wines and to sell it to different countries and one bottle uh, belong to that company and this uh, glass also belong to that company it's really important and um, some of them and, uh, I want to mention um, uh, just like winemaking was a was a, a piece of their lives. It's not uh, only just a company factory. Even every people had you know cellars in their houses, and they had a wooden barrels, and they can kept their wines inside their house. It's also interesting. Um, for example. Uh, in this uh, photo, you can see the house of Victor Klein, who was the last representative of Germans uh, who came from in the from uh, 19th century, the descendant of that nations. Uh, it's a house of the uh, uh, photo is kept in our museum. Uh, it's a view of the house of that, that Victor Klein. And uh, even Victor Klein had some, uh, uh, I mean, uh, cellars, which uh, he kept there his uh, own uh, wine barrels and another photo modern view of his house uh, after his death in uh, 2000 or 7 uh, this house began to use as the, and uh, under the minister of uh, culture and if you can uh, go there you can visit his house now they use it as a museum and then um, I, I um, want to uh, show okay Sarah, before before you move I'm also wondering because you know, maybe audience might also uh, be interested mm -hmm. to hear about what happened to this, uh, you know, German settlements because okay. I believe during the Second World War, like their fate. Yeah, yeah, I, I will. I uh, come here. Okay, you know, uh, they live in the uh, good conditions we cannot say of course um uh, there are problems but we cannot say uh, they had uh, a, a lot of a big problems because they can uh, study in their own uh, german language they can their schools they had a uh, theater uh, uh, theaters clubs sport clubs uh, and then they had a um, um, course uh, and different uh, important uh, community the first school was open 1842 then uh, the first church was opened and um built um and even their streets and in on helen and and in Anand were uh were the same in um europe and by the way i want to note that it, it they were the swabian uh, germans um from uh, germany from wittenberg and all uh german lived here in peace unfortunately till the, sec till the second world war because during the second world war um under the order of stalin they were were um, exiled, deport, depart, deported uh, Kazakhstan, SS, uh, Soviet Socialist Republic, and uh, just let people, they let Germans who had um, mixed marriage, and they can uh, stay in Azerbaijan, not in, uh, they, but others had to uh, move, had to leave Azerbaijan. That's why uh, only after um, uh, end of uh, 70 years uh, of 19th century, after the uh, rehabilitation uh, some of them uh, began to um, uh, give uh, come 
all main group of Germans uh, went to Germany if they are not uh, in Azerbaijan. The last representative was that guy which I told you about, Victor Klein. He was from 1935. Yeah, he also was um, from the uh, mixed family. That's why his family stayed here, could stay here. And he lost his life 2007. But other families had to leave Azerbaijan. They couldn't live in um, here during the Second World War because you know that uh, there were conflicts between the Soviet Union and Germany. That's why as a German uh, Soviet uh, Union such policy, not only Germans, different uh, nations uh, migrated. Uh, they forced them to leave uh, their land and they began to live in the different uh, countries, first in Kazakhstan, but of course during migration, during road, uh, that uh, hard road, they, some of them can lose their lives, some of them can ex uh, were exiled. That's why it was just during uh, Second World War they uh, they were faced with difficulties in other period, even because different buildings, uh, even during real Russia and uh, uh, as of, even now, they we have now a more uh, approximately uh, 700 German but not uh, completely from the that uh, Germans. Uh, they are just modern, uh, like architects, uh, scientists, doctors, engineers, but they are not the uh, completely direct representatives of that Germans who came to Azerbaijan in the 19th century. Um, uh, that's why I say the last representative, because who were from that uh, came here from that period, say um, their lives and they were exiled and some after rehabilitation they were uh, they went to Germany. Thank you. Thank you settlements of Azerbaijan that were settled in early 19th century with the uh, with the um, you know due to several reasons and they happened to, to uh, you know reside in the western part of Azerbaijan and then felt yeah. and and um, mm, the other settlement that that uh, what was the other's name? Annenfeld and uh, Helen My uh, my own grandma actually grew up in in uh, Annenfeld, and that's where she learned German language. And later on, she became German language instructor. So she lived with with Germans. And uh, the the house that she she has still exists, and I've been there several times. I've seen the basement where they like the, normally German houses had this basement where they, every single house yes, had, had yes. their own wine making. So these basements yes. were made to, for, for the wine making. And, and of course, it, like, you know, Azerbaijani wine making has been hugely influenced by, by uh, those of the German uh, wine makers. Um, mm -hmm. If no question uh, with regards to Azerba Germans of Azerbaijan, uh, then I'm going to move to the next speaker. Uh, Farida Khalilova. Uh, finally, Farida Khalilova is a researcher in the Ethnography Fund of National Museum of History of Azerbaijan, and her research explores uh, the role of a woman in Azerbaijani art. Uh, she's um, involved in research and promotion of museum materials, Farida. And today, uh, Farida will talk about the role of Talish woman in the development of ancient form of craftsmanship in Azerbaijan. Uh, this ancient form of craft craftsmanship is called wicker making. So let's see what wicker making is and how it still continues to exist amongst one of the minority groups of Azerbaijan who are Talish people. The floor is yours, uh, everyone. First of all, I want to thank uh, the, the Union of uh, Young Scholars of the uh, Nationalism of History of Azerbaijan and uh, uh, the Kafka Surda Network. It's my uh, first seminar here, and I hope that it, uh, it will not be the last. Uh, climatic and geographical conditions uh, of the territory uh, of uh, Azerbaijan uh, created conditions uh, for the development of many crafts here. Of course, uh, one of the main uh, factors is that the region is uh, one of the oldest human settlements. And uh, once all the uh, occupations in world history with the art of waving, uh, gradually in the Neolithic era, the art of waving began to take shape. Uh, nevertheless, the art of knitting has managed to maintain its relevance to this day. Uh, Wiki can be considered one of the most ancient craftsmanship, uh, not only in Azerbaijan, but all over the world. Uh, the waving of straw and wicker baskets is one of the 
uh, all these inventions in human story history uh, we are in Azerbaijan mainly uh, widespread in Lankaran, Astara and Masal regions uh, uh, and the the Talish people are considered uh, the main carriers. Wicker uh, is uh, woven from plants uh, that grow in humid places, especially in the southern regions of Azerbaijan, which is called uh, Zilik Zil Puza. Uh, they are still uh, used uh, in uh, the household of the population of uh, the southern regions in Azerbaijan. This is due to the fact that uh, this area is a humid zone. Uh, it should be noted that uh, two, two main types of weaker looms uh, have survived, uh, vertical and uh, horizontal. However, the uh, technology is largely in, in this uh, in this uh, uh, We can see the photo uh, preserved in the photo negative font of, of the museum. Uh, of our museum. Uh, in this photo, uh, two women uh, wave cap from weaker. Uh, uh, in the past, uh, weaker often replaced cap. Um, and mothers even want them to give their daughters a, a, a dowry. Well, their families uh, protect uh, their homes uh, from deafness by placing a wicker on the uh, woolen cup. So uh, the waving process, uh, process was carried out with a board called C uh, or Tumonasi on the loom. Uh, Talish uh, women make special ropes uh, waving them with their own hands. Uh, uh, then uh, on this roof fixed on both sides, uh, the waving process is carried out, wrapping uh, the loops with a wooden pool uh, called Manasi. Uh, this uh, Talish people uh, call uh, this horizontal loom uh, da dasko. Uh, the sample of Manasi, as you see, is also preserved in, in the ethnographic font of the museum. Uh, during uh, this uh, physically demanding process, women can spend as little as uh, one to two hours waving a wicker uh, that is uh, used uh, as a cup, uh, depend uh, depending uh, on the patent's uh, face, length, and width. Uh, the cup can be waved for uh, three or five days. Uh, as uh, in the art of waving, uh, women uh, learn to wave from their mothers, or in many cases, their mothers in law. Uh, the manufacture of various household uh, items from store showed that women choose uh, this art at the main occupation. Uh, uh, straw basket, story, storage containers uh, of various sizes, needle uh, set containers, uh, silk containers, trays, scales, po pottery hangers, and uh, etc. Uh, et are stored in the National Museum of History of Azerbaijan. Uh, the ethnographic font of the museum contains mainly samples of the 19th century. Uh, in August uh, 1963, uh, 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 the staff of the National Museum of History of Azerbaijan uh, brought from the expedition uh, to the village uh, uh, to the village of uh, Shaklafuja of uh, Lankaran region a number of weaker samples. Among them, a small scales are an interesting, interesting example. Uh, it had a uh, wave from a uh, leaf uh, a kind of plant. In addition, uh, several samples of small carved weaker obtained during the expedition uh, were donated to, to the farm. Each of these weaker uh, is woven uh, with uh, different uh, dense uh, geometric patterns. Such weakers uh, were commonly used, uh, used uh, as rugs. Uh, one uh, of uh, these examples was used to place it uh, in front of a uh, window. Uh, there is not a uh, photo of this uh, sample, but it looks like uh, this. Uh, presumably, such rugs laid uh, in front of window were needed only to protect against uh, moisture. Ethnographic uh, materials testify that the Talish women not only mastered uh, the secrets uh, of the art of waving, uh, but also took care, uh, uh, took care of its pre uh, preser um, preservation, considering uh, it uh, their duty to instill uh, the traditions of this art uh, in their children. Uh, the manufacturing process of figure products is long and laborious. Even during the summer months, women go to collect plants, which are used as raw materials. Uh, all of the in the fall waving of wicker from uh, materials begins. Depending on the size uh, and purpose of the project, uh, several hours uh, are allotted for the waving process. 
In the past, uh, Talish, a woman made house of eating from weaker became a part of their lives. Recently, however, a week of May, uh, waving uh, has arrived in people's lives uh, today. Women wave store products all month exclusively for sale. Uh, this labor intensive product is so, uh, sold at a low price. Uh, many patterns uh, uh, wave uh, on week of products. Uh, however, on light carbs, uh, it was a little dip difficult to wave. Uh, with patterns. Uh, when we look at the samples uh, kept uh, in the uh, in the museum, we come to the conclusion that the wicker was mainly woven with uh, geometric patterns. Uh, we can explain uh, this by the structure of the raw material used to, to wave the wicker. Uh, from the samples of wickers preserved in the museum, it's also clear that uh, the materials were rarely painted. painted. Uh, the paint was mainly used uh, on patterns. In general, uh, it was difficult to paint the wicker. Uh, this uh, use of dyes in wicker can be explained by their drying after waving, unlike wool. Among uh, the sample, uh, samples kept in the museum, we also found a wicker in which a uh, paint was uh, used. Uh, in this uh, example, uh, uh, the attention uh, is uh, drawn to the uh, round rack used uh, as a tray. Uh, in the everyday life of Azerbaijan, the use of uh, copper trays is more uh, typical. However, the high development of a waving of wicker among the Talish uh, resulted in the production of a wide variety of products from store. It's possible that the such wicker uh, were used to uh, accommodate lighter items or just food. Uh, among uh, the painted samples, uh, there are also containers of different size. Uh, you saw before. Uh, Talish, uh, leading, Talish people living in the south of, uh, south, south of Azerbaijan make a great contribution to the preservation of this handicraft art. Uh, despite the fact that this handicraft art uh, practically is no longer in use in different parts of the country, the Talish population managed to preserve this custom and tradition, which makes it uh, necessary to be a uh, of society. Thank you for your attention. We have heard um, uh, all the, the presenters, uh, they presented certain exemplary materials, uh, be it in craftsmanship that belongs to Talish people or, or um, for example, the, the certain clothing that belongs to the Azerbaijan Jews uh, throughout the history that they, they wore. Um, or, or a domestic lifestyle of one of the ethnic minority groups in Azerbaijan who are uh, Germans. Uh, um, unfortunately, like for example, the, the, when it comes to the case of Germans, um, they, they already don't exist in Azerbaijan due to several reasons, particularly due to the Stalin's uh, policy, which you know, expelled them to, to Kazakhstan and other parts of Soviet Union. And even though after the Stalinization of Khrushchev, some of them returned back, but majority stayed in the in the region that they were expelled to. Uh, but uh, most of these, the other uh, minorities, be it Jews, be it Talish, and the rest of them that still exists, they are, uh, you know, they, they have this uh, peaceful existence or uh, what, what Yuli has called, they have this conviviality that, that what makes the case of Azerbaijan an um, interesting case. Uh, and it makes it multicultural. Of course, the debate of multiculturalism is a, you know, it's a philosophical debate amongst the uh, political philosophers and amongst sociologists. And, and uh, to what extent Azerbaijani version can fit into this uh, multiculturalism or maybe this multicultural, but, uh, but uh, it still requires more uh, policies uh, in order to you know, reflect this 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 multiculturalism in 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 um, you know the the ethnic and national and other minority groups everyday lives, but it is certain that these groups exist in Azerbaijan peacefully and they have this shared uh, you know everyday uh, shared like they share each other's cultures and there are a lot of cultural influences that that these minority groups 
uh, um, share with each other. Um, if there are any questions that uh, from the audience, who, whoever might be interested in one of the example samples or maybe theoretical debate of multiculturalism or conviviality, whichever is um, more uh, fitting to the case of Azerbaijan, you guys can raise a hand or write in the, in the chat so I can maybe um, uh, utter that uh, comment or question raised by Ruben uh, Tavtian. Uh, Ruben, can you open your, uh, uh, can you unmute yourself or? Right, yeah. thank you very much. So thank you everybody for the really interesting uh, presentations. My questions or, uh, I mean, uh, and also thank you uh, to you, Mi Kamran, for the uh, conclusion. Uh, my question goes in the direction of what you had said, and particularly my response is more to Yulia Alieva. Um, so basically, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, you, I, I totally share your, uh, um, uh, your conclusions and your ideas about multiculturalism but one particular point so um, in fact I guess we should uh, uh, I mean it's not my idea that's what I heard from my colleagues from Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology who are uh, you know it's very very fashionable right now to make research on identities and nationalism uh, which is very good of course but uh, I would, uh, what I uh, aim to say is that we really have to, have to, um, which is very hard, but we have to start to distinguish the representation of multiculturalism and the real coexistence. Uh, for instance, uh, Sevinj Asimova was very uh, fantastic fantastic presentation, thank you very much. Uh, in the introduction, she mentioned, she pointed out the, let's say, somewhat, uh, let's put it in this word, idealized version of multiculturalism in Azerbaijan. And she also pointed out the, the, the year of multiculturalism in Azerbaijan. I don't really know when it was, I guess 2000, right? But co co correct me if I'm, wrong. Um, so, um, Julia, uh, what do you think? So, um, is, is there a strong uh, up to down perspective of multi multiculturalism? Uh, so, why I'm taking, in fact, what I'm saying is much more of a European view of this, con uh, European view on, on this concept, because you, uh, you uh, noticed it very correctly. In Europe, uh, we we have like a flow against multiculturalism, but uh, uh, according to the anthropological research, it's not genuinely against uh, culture uh, against um, uh, cultural or ethnic minorities. It's more or less against the representation of them. So we have here some particular thing, which let's say, for instance, uh, leftists or also right wings in Europe are, um, are kind of against the symbolic representation, the signs of multiculturalism, but not really against them. And in fact, this is also a kind of a protest against the ruling parties or the ruling system, because they consider multiculturalism as a uh, up to down uh, process and now not down. Uh, how was the opposite of up to down? Down to up, yeah. <laughs> so up. it comes. So it bottom up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So it doesn't come from the folk, yeah, or well, the concept of folk, but it comes from the politics. And uh, uh, in case of uh, Azerbaijan, I guess we, we we also can have a good example. I mean, uh, I don't say that. Uh, one ethnic group hates the other necessarily, of course. I mean, you really showed that they are also very good successful examples. But I would like to, uh, I would like Yulia uh, um, Alieva to mention this aspect, how much politics, political narratives are, are um, integrated here. Sorry for my long talk, just it was accumulated and wanted to hear everybody. But again, thank you very much to everybody and to the museum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my, my understanding of Ruben's question is, correct me if I'm wrong, to what extent the political 
uh, representation uh, kind of distorts the real narrative, the reality. Is that what you are kind of asking? It, exactly, exactly. I mean, Azerbaijan is in fact, uh, okay, it's for sure multi-ethnic country, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, it's more than 90% and with it, it's one of the most mono-ethnic countries in the world. Not the most, not the most, there are much more other differences, but in fact, like all countries, uh, maybe there are some 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 exceptions, like in Ocea Oceania or Micronesia, where hundred percent of the population belong to one ethnic group. Okay, but ninety nine percent of countries are multiculturalism in the sense that that there are more more ethnic groups, more religious groups or in general, more subgroups. Nowadays, it's impossible to, to have monolithic country, right? So, but yeah, in fact, that, that that's what I, I hint to, right? So um, how much does it cover the real, real, yeah. But yeah. also, uh, and also what are the methods of this representation? Okay. So now floor is Julia, go ahead, if you want to answer. Yeah, unfortunately I didn't have that, much of the time to elaborate on kind of uh, Azerbaijan version yeah, of multicultural, but yeah, I think I mentioned in my presentation that you know it's mostly kind of top down approach nowadays. Yeah, so it's mostly kind of again, as you are saying, kind of the political representation, you know, of certain political agenda that's going on in Azerbaijan. And I think uh, politicization, you know, has two sides of the coin. Yeah, so kind of it can be treated as something which is positive and also, you know, again, you know, depending on where do you stand, you know, in all this political spectrum. Uh, but from my experiences, like again, from uh, the work that I've done, and for instance, um, in January, the Max Planck um, kind of Institute, uh, they are publishing this new diversities journal and it's, uh, they published my article on um, non-traditional religious communities in Azerbaijan, non-traditional Christian communities. And uh, in conversation with them, I got this experience that actually they are happy about this politics, you know, and many things has changed toward the positive when this politics, you know, was launched by the government. At least they don't have issues now with state reg registration, they can um, uh, openly practice. Uh, so in general, communities are really, kind of are welcoming this kind of politics. Um, so again, um, so it certainly benefits certain communities, you know, the government is also allocating money for some communities, like not along uh, these religious boundaries, but let's say uh, along the ethnic boundaries as well, you know, so that they can uh, say, and you know, the educational curriculum is changing, you know, for instance, what I noticed that for instance, uh, my son is studying in secondary school, and now they have readings in their literature textbooks. Like they have um, kind of one Georgian poet, you know, who was born and who kind of lives in uh, like Ingeloid, you know, uh, community. Uh, they have J one Jewish um, author from Baku. They have one Russian person who I didn't even know about him, like who was um, bounded during the Second World War. He relocated then to Azerbaijan. He was here in the hospital. Then he uh, decided to stay and live in Azerbaijan. And then he started translating Azerbaijani authors to um, Russian language. So he's basically learned Azerbaijan. And then he also started writing uh, kind of his own. So, you know, you see that, you know, there are certain changes of incorporation, all of these narratives, even into the school curriculum. So that, you know, the students gonna be also aware, not just that, you know, there are all these people who exist, but also they are aware about the narrative that exists in these communities, you know, the, I don't know, some cultural dynamic, you know, that, but again, there is this issue like who is included and who is excluded yeah and why yeah what are the reasons and so i think that is one of the issues you know that azerbaijan is struggling right now yeah kind of how you know to deal with all of that how to deal with this kind of diversity yeah and again this politics of inclusion so i don't really want to go too much because i just don't think we have enough time for that yeah uh, but I, I don't know, like, did I manage to address your question? Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, that if uh, to create equal rights for everybody, 
uh, I think it's uh, possible uh, to uh, coexistence. You know, uh, just um, there will not, uh, there must not be any odds to anyone. Everybody must be equal, and then um, the um, as justice will be. And uh, when everybody sees that justice is a um, law in uh, how to, uh, to say that uh, no one have got any odds then I think it's possible to live to uh, multicultural. And the people who live in Azerbaijan, the ethnic groups uh, who live in Azerbaijan, they see that um, they are equal. Uh, as I am in uh, Azerbaijan, the Jewish in Azerbaijan, Talish, Kurd, we are all uh, equal in Azerbaijan and we have got equal rights uh, in Azerbaijan. That's why I think it's uh, a nice uh, sample of multiculturalism. Thank you. Thank you, Sevinj. And I also would say, you know, even, even though I'm a moderator, but I also feel like giving this comment that, you know, as a nationalism studies uh, graduate, uh, there, is a, there is an author called Laia Greenfield, and she has a, like, she categorized, uh, um, like, the, the Western nationalism that emerged after the French Revolution into three categories. And one of these categories is a French version of nationalism, which is civic and collective. Uh, nationalism. And then there is a German version of nationalism, which is ethnic collective. And there is British version of nationalism, which is um, civic and individualistic. So Azerbaijani um, national identity uh, fits into this, like rather it's, it's, it's very similar to French model. It has this civic character, which uh, puts all the ethnic and national groups to the Azerbaijani identity. Uh, and that makes it uh, much more like easy for the Azerbaijan to switch from from uh, you know the, this Azerbaijani identity to multicultural uh, Azerbaijaniness because there is already this civic identity because like the the umbrella identity of Azerbaijaniness already creates that uh, that uh, civic um, civic uh, community uh, understanding. Um, that's why I do believe you know the uh, currently you know there are there are policies that are carried out by the government. And of course, there are certain shortcomings within these policies, be it in the education sector or be it in, in, in any uh, field. But um, I do believe that there is, there is a, a chance to perfect these policies and, and these policies can, can be reflected in, in people's daily lives in, in, the, in the rural areas and also in, in urban areas. Um, that's all I can say. Um, um, now I'm gonna give the floor to our um, hosts uh, for their concluding statements. Cameron, but before concluding, can I have a question? I think I am late to give a question. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I would like to give a question, maybe Farida, from the perspective of like small businesses and uh, entrepreneurship uh, supporting the Talish women in Azerbaijan. Because recently I come across there is a like craftsmanship and wicker baskets and um, like small businesses and uh, how they supporting Azerbaijan Talish women. Is there anything you can give more example and elaborate on that? Is there... Um... Uh, in the modern time, uh, more of the vehicle products uh, are using uh, in the, as a, de a decoration um, in the restaurants, in the hotels, hotels. Uh, that's uh, Peter. It's not a widespread uh, business. Uh, as I said, uh, they sold it a very uh, low price, a low price. Uh, but uh, in uh, the southern region, uh, they use uh, the wicker product uh, at their household now. Uh, but uh, in uh, all, all uh, the all uh, in all Azerbaijan, it's not widespread uh, their products, uh, and um, only um, as I said, uh, they uh, we use uh, in the cities as a, de a decoration, uh, and uh, they sold it uh, to the tourists. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. So thank you very much, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for your for joining and for your contribution, and uh, our moderator Mir Kamran for your excellent moderating, and uh, our speakers as well. And um, yeah, if 
you have any question ideas uh, I will put in the chat box uh, so we have the our email uh, you can if you have any idea if you want to present your work uh, please get in touch so coxes through time gmail at gmail.com I think yes right so again thank you everyone and we'll look forward to seeing you in our future events um, and follow us on twitter facebook youtube and it will be available on our uh, youtube channel